Writing machine learning models in your notebook isn't enough to break into data anymore. To become a data scientist now, it's much more than just writing a few machine learning models and keeping them locally in your notebook and just aiming for the highest accuracy. People now have to adapt and in order to do so, you have to improve certain skills that will make you more valuable as a data scientist, which means going from local to production mode. The production mindset is something that is very daunting for many data scientists because it involves a lot of engineering. So today, let me share with you a roadmap and the things that you need to upskill on so that you can become hopefully a very successful data scientist. And these are things that I'm also upskilling in and doing projects on. So you'll find an end-to-end -end machine learning project that I did recently, you'll find it in the description below. So you can go have a look and practice with me if some of these concepts might feel a bit abstract at the moment, but they will make more sense. The problems with roadmaps usually is they are often too clean and too simplistic. They focus too much on the foundations and too little on the real business value. Today we're gonna to mix both. We're gonna go from the foundations until the deployment and how to make sure that your work delivers value. First is the foundations. These are non-negotiables. You need to be able to code with Python, to write clean code, not just in notebooks, but really be able to modularize things and just write the logic and all the process in Python. You also need to be able to query uh, from databases with SQL, understand statistics and mathematics because it's the core logic of machine learning models and deep learning models. And also become comfortable with Git and version control. Uh, Git basically helps you uh, save your progress, collaborate with others um, and save all of your project code and data if needed on GitHub. Uh, I've made a video on this because I know a lot of people struggle with Git. They find it really daunting initially, but I really broke it down for you very simply so you can go and find some resources on it. I also have videos on SQL, so just go on my YouTube channel where you'll find plenty so I don't bombard you with a lot of video suggestions here. Second is core data science skills. This is already talking about stuff that is quite exciting for people. We'll first talk about EDA, which is the Exploratory Data Analytics. This involves a lot of data experimentation, cleaning, analytics, visualization, all the cool parts about doing data science. I wouldn't say the cleaning part is the coolest, but I would say that the process feels like you make progress in and you can see the results straight after making some changes. Uh, you also have feature engineering, which involves handling if there are missing values, uh, if you need to do some feature encoding, one hot encoding, if you need to split your data, do you split it by time? Do you split it randomly? It depends on the situation. So this is something really interesting to go into. And I do have this book called Designing Machine Learning Systems uh, by Chip Hewen, which is a gem into building the intuition on what you need to focus on uh, when building machine learning systems. And there is a feature engineering section here that helps me a lot every time I go back to it if, if I forget something. Uh, then you have machine learning basics, uh, which basically covers anything from regression models, linear regression, logistic regression, pre-based models, decision trees. You have also XGBoost, LightGBM. There are plenty of models uh, that you could explore. There are also deep learning models like Keras or PyTorch and things like this. There's a lot to discover, but you can start simple and then you obviously iterate over time. You don't need to know all of them as long as you understand the core principles overall. Then over time, you'll start to build more of an intuition where each model works better because it always depends on the use case. And machine learning classification problem is not the same as clustering or regression or fraud detection or you know, there is nuance and that, that's something to consider over time. Also, evaluation metrics are very important. So when we think of classification, a lot of people jump into accuracy, but no, you could optimize for precision, you could optimize for recall. Recently, I've done a project on uh, detecting email spams and in email spams, the recall is the most important because the false negatives where our model can't predict sometimes when it's a spam and it classifies it as positive, it does affect the model massively. And uh, depending on the context and the business context, you might want to optimize for a specific metric compared to another one. And the same applies for aggression and so on. Number three is go beyond the Kaggle mindset. So Kaggle is good when you want to practice projects, 
The data is all there for you. It's usually all clean or there is very minimal cleaning to do. It's usually quite small, so it's not large uh, as you find sometimes in uh, real world environments. So to practice, clearly it's good, but sometimes you have to be a little bit more creative and start to do your own projects, which means that you need to start with the problematic and then figure out where to get the data from and how to clean it and how to structure it and do all that stuff. With Kaggle, you still find some really cool projects. So try to dig into some that you haven't seen before. So it pushes you to understand more about the industry, what they care about, what are the KPIs they want to analyze, what's the machine learning metrics that you need to optimize for. Yeah, just going for something more complex sometimes might help. You'll find some videos on my channel going into projects so you can go and have a look. But the matter here is to practice and to just go beyond the notebook style, try to deploy your model into the, the internet so that it's usable by anyone. And just so that it gives you that reassurance that now it goes from being local and look cool as a demo to being usable in production. Number four is engineering practices. And in here is where the, a lot of data scientists start to choke. <laughs> and I used to be the same. When I hear containers, the ICD pipelines, unit tests, smoke tests, I'm like, gosh, this is not the machine learning accuracy kind of vibe with a lot of visualizations. But without these steps, you will never be able to deploy to the world what you're doing. And the value of everything that you build is zero because you will live in your notebook and no user will ever use it. So a few things that you can start with is Docker. This is just a way to package or containerize uh, your whole project so it's reproducible. So anyone can use the project from anywhere. Usually what happens is that since you have a specific set of libraries and tools and environments, if another person doesn't have it, things will break. But when you put the environment, all of it, in your Docker and you share it with someone else, then they can literally just do or run the project from the same container and it will run perfectly because they literally have the same environment as you. Regarding the CI-CD pipeline, this is more to run, test and deploy what's inside that container and push it to the cloud. And one of the tools that I use is GitHub Actions. There is also Jenkins, there is GitLab also, CI. So there are a few tools that you could use. Start with GitHub Actions because most people are familiar with the GitHub environment already. So that's a good starting point. And for unit tests, uh, I would say the testing is, is a valuable skill in your data project. So always think of tests in each step, especially when it's an important step, so that uh, you're just sure that things are not crazy weird or there are many outliers or something that you didn't notice. So it's always worth including a checks and tests uh, in your code. Number five is deployment. And here uh, you'll need to get familiar with Fast API or Flask for APIs. I usually work with Fast API. It's one of the standards in the market. It's quite advanced, but it's easy to start. You'll find a video on my end-to-end -end project. You can see how I did set up things and it's quite easy and straightforward overall. But this step is really important for you to deploy. It gives you an access to HTTP, so basically to the web. Uh, so that your model is usable from the internet. And this is an important step. You also need to figure out if you're gonna be doing stream, if you're gonna be doing real-time prediction or batch prediction. The so real-time, if you have a stream of data that is incoming and um, it's like real-time uh, feel, then you're gonna go more for that. If you have a batch of data that comes every week and then you rerun the model on them, then that's what is called a batch. So you're gonna find this also in this book. And it's really interesting because different approaches require different kind of um, deployment methods. But something that is very important to notice in deployment is that the model will drift, the data might change. So you need to put things in place for you to, to be able to monitor those things. Uh, so monitoring is a very, very important step. And it's one of the main things that people do in deployment. They, they, they monitor the latency, the data drift, and that's something to really, really consider. And also there is versioning and data models. So when we talk about versioning, there is code versioning with Git, there is machine learning model versioning with MLflow, for example. There's your data versioning as well. So there are a lot of things that you want to version so that you can revert back if needed. So these things, they add complexity, obviously, but you'll thank yourself for <laughs> learning these skills because one day you'll need the model from one month ago that performed well for whatever reason. And if you can track it back, trace it back and go back to it, 
then it's just loss because you will never remember some hyperparameters that you did one month ago. Number six, cloud and infrastructure. A lot of companies these days leverage the cloud, uh, AWS, GCP, Azure, mainly these, the top three. But you need to get the basics around these uh, because a lot, a lot of people use them. There are a lot of machine learning um, services inside of them like Vertex AI for GCP or um, AWS SageMaker for AWS. And you don't have to use all the machine learning services within AWS because that might be costly, unless that's something your company does. By just being familiar with how to store your data, for example, in an S3 bucket on AWS, how to set up the um, identity and access management, how to use AWS SageMaker, Notebook or Studio, um, use the container on ECS on AWS, things like this that can help you really deploy uh, your model and give it access to, to the web via uh, a DNS or a load balancer. So these are things that you need to get familiar with. Nothing too complex, you're not a solutions architect here, but it's good to get hands-on in one of the clouds. Just pick one and do a few projects on it. And seven, soft skills really matter. A lot of people really stand out by understanding the business, uh, being good communicators, and being really good at collaborating and managing their time. You wouldn't believe how important it is to understand the industry you operate in. You can be as skilled as you want, but if right now you're forced to work in an electronics company that makes electronics for mining uh, gold, all your skills you'll feel like, where do I even start? Because the metrics, the KPIs, the data, the context is different. So understanding the business is really important and the industry as well. Collaborating and communicating is also a very valuable skill. You won't be hidden all the time be behind your computer. You'll be talking to stakeholders, your teammates, your manager, your boss, whoever, and you need to be able to have a conversation to understand what's going on in the first place because that's from where you can get all the insights you need to be able to develop whatever you're gonna develop. And also understanding what the end user wants and not just how can I improve accuracy for the sake of improving it. As I mentioned earlier, I did a full end-to-end -end machine learning project. It's an hour and a half. It's a churn machine learning problem. Uh, you're gonna just find it in here where I walk you through from A to Z, from getting the data, into analyzing it, structuring your project, doing all the pipelines, the feature pipeline, training pipeline, inference pipeline, a fast API endpoint, MLflow for experiment tracking, Docker for containers, GitHub Actions for CI CD pipeline, and deploying to the cloud on AWS. You see everything, just go and watch in here.